You know, my favorite word is wow. Wow. Let's say it together. Wow. This add Jesus and then wow, okay? Jesus, wow. This add counselor with wow. Counselor, wow. Mighty God, wow. <laughs> I mean, we could spend the rest of this service talking about wow. God is a wow God, amen? I tell you, and wow, it's just perfect worship. Me and Carolyn was praying this morning, and I said, God, may our worship be a sweet-smelling aroma. I believe it was a sweet-smelling aroma to God this morning. Wow. Wow. Well, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Charlie and Steve, if you'll come. Praise God. Well, let's join together in prayer. Charlie, please. Yes. We pray that our, our praise will be accepted. And Lord, we got so much to be thankful for, so many blessings. We just take it too much with the Lord, but I just want to thank you this time for so many blessings. Yes. And Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to give and to give and we'll learn to use your money wise this church by house and pastor. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. This morning, as I share with you in the next few moments, uh, the theme this morning, I uh, and sometimes I title my messages, but the basis of true fellowship is intimacy theology or intimate theology. And I want you to think about this, uh, intimate relationship with the God of heaven. Isn't that a, a, a phenomenal thought that you could have an intimate relationship with God? That you could have an in, intimate relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. And how many of you are convinced, or I want you to be convinced, that God desires that. Amen? God wants to have an intimate relationship, a meaningful and, and, and something very special that develops within our lives. You know... Uh, in my uh, uh, devotions uh, one day this week, uh, the, uh, the title of that devotion was Intimate Theology. And it began to stir something in me as I read that devotional. And uh, the, the question that was asked in that devotion, it says, do you believe? So let me ask that question. Do you believe? And that question, you know, Jesus, when he was dealing with Mary and Martha, in John 11, he asked Martha, he says, do you believe? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that I am the Son of God? Uh, and that was a challenge to her because she believed if he had been there, her brother would have been healed. But he wanted her to go beyond that and believe that he was truly the Son of God, that he truly was the way for salvation, that you could have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And so I began to work on that thought. And, you know, I believe a decision that all of us has to make, we should make a commitment that we believe that he is the Son of God. How many of you agree with that? That we believe that he came into this world to uh, go to the cross to make a way that we could have an intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father, that we could encounter him in our, our lives on a daily basis. And uh, so as you think about this this morning, I, I want to share with you that I believe my challenge for you. One, that you would leave here saying, I am committed to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
that you would leave here to say, I am committed to his word and that I want to know his word. I want his word to take root within my life. I, I was talking to Jeff Wisely this week, and, and we were sharing on the phone, and, and Jeff said, I'd love to come and play the sax, and I'd love to come and share. And he said, do you believe in the rhema word? And I said, oh, do I ever believe in the rhema word? And that's what I want the word to become, revealed word to you, that it reveals to you that you can have this intimate relationship, that he reveals to you that his word can be active and powerful and effective and have results in your life, okay? So I want you to have a commitment to Jesus. I want you to have a commitment to his word. And I want you, not only that, I want you to be committed to the Holy Spirit, that it would work powerfully within your life. Do you realize I've just covered the Trinity for you? But all of that is part of you having an intimate relationship. How many realize he says, I'll not leave you alone. I'll not leave you with helpless. I'll, you know, I'll not abandon you. I'm going to send a helper, a paraclete. He'll be in you, and he'll be along with you, and he'll never leave you. He'll always be there. Aren't you glad we have the Holy Spirit that does that? And that Holy Spirit is there to help us have an intimate relationship. Well, what I've just explained to you is the meaning of fellowship, is the meaning of relationship, the meaning of developing a meaningful life. Now, take your Bible and turn with me to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. And I want you to listen to these scriptures. We're going to do Acts 2.42. But in John, 1 John 1, 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifest. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that, we, uh, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. How many of you like to have joy unspeakable and full of glory? Well, I'm going to tell you what, as we go through this and you develop this intimate relationship with him, your life can be bubbling over with the joy of the Lord and the excitement. Wouldn't it neat to hear the testimonies tonight and the, and the things that uh, uh, people are thankful for? And, and uh, how many realize we're a blessed group of people? Amen? We're blessed in our going. We're blessed in our coming. All that we set our hands, God says, I want to bless you as a child of God. So as we go through this, now look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. I want you to pick up something here. There's four different things in there, but there's two things I want you to really pick up in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. It says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. Now, I want you to pick up there because he says in John, he says, I want you to have fellowship with us. I want you to have relationship with us. I want you to be connected. I want you to experience what we've experienced because we've seen it, we've handled it, we've been involved with it. We, our lives have been transformed by this eternal life, this intimate relationship with Jesus. So what did they do as the early New Testament church was being formed? They continued steadfastly in this relationship because the apostles were teaching and revealing the ways of God to have an intimate relationship. So it says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Now, I want you to think about they continued with the apostles' teaching and they continued in a fellowship because here's something I want you to understand as we go through these next series of, of teachings and preaching, that you have to have a vertical, intimate relationship with God. You have to be connected, and that connection is through Jesus Christ, and that should be an intimate relationship that is really the meaning of a fellowship, that you are in fellowship with God, that you are in perfect relation, intimate relationship. And then it becomes horizontal because we should be the reflection of that relationship with one another. And we're going to talk about a lot about that again, as I've been sharing with you quite often here lately. You see, we can talk about 
fellowship. You know, and when I think the word fellowship has lost its meaning to the church. And that's what I, I wanted to spend some time on because when we talk about fellowship, I don't know whether we realize it's relationship. I don't know whether we realize it, it's, it's this relationship that we have with God that affects the relationship or the fellowship that joins us together as a body of believers. And so when we think of fellowship, sometimes we think of, of dinners. We think of, you know, maybe getting together and socializing. But I want you to understand it's more deeper than that. And, and I think you would agree. See if you would agree with this. True fellowship involves getting together for spiritual purposes. Would you not agree with that? Okay. True fellowship is sharing of needs among one another. True fellowship is praying together that God would meet those needs. True fellowship is discussing and sharing the word and encouraging and bringing comfort and help and strength to one another. Would you not agree with those? Uh, they're all, all uh, things about fellowship. Fellowship is an, people caring for one another and putting needs of others ahead of our own needs, caring for one another, going the extra mile. All these things. How many of you agree that everything I've said so far sounds pretty, pretty cool? Now, let me share this with you. And I want you to think about this because what I'm going to share with you is a deeper meaning than that. Because everybody agreed. And how many realize we lack some of the things that I just read? But I want to even go deeper because one of the things that I've had in, in my life that uh, I, I, not only am I a pastor, but I'm a defender of the church because the fact of it is my heart is for the head of the church. His name happens to be Jesus. And if he died for the church, then I need to help people have a respect for the church. Does that make sense? I need to help people understand the importance of the church. And I need to help people have such a hunger that they want to be a part of the family of God. Does that make sense to you? And you see, the reason some of that's missing in churches today is we've lost the meaning of fellowship. And this fellowship is a relationship, an intimate relationship that involves the connection to Jesus Christ, that involves the connection of being connected to one another and, uh, and developing this meaningful relationship. Now, there's two words that are important words that I'm, I'm going to introduce to you. Uh, Kanoanos, kanoanos is one word. Koinia is part of that word, and we're going to talk about that. But here's what that word means. It means companionship. It means communion. It means fellowship. It means partakers. It means partners. How many of you realize that we need to have companionship with Jesus and with the Heavenly Father? We need to have communion with him. You see, we talk about in a church, we take communion. But have you realized the importance of what I want you to understand is that if we are the Kanoanos, then we are a family of God who is united through Jesus Christ and that we become a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we should have communion together. We should have companionship together. We should have, be partakers of the good things of God together. We should be partners in representing the kingdom of God here on earth. Okay? Now, the other word that I want you to I introduce to you is medica. And that's, that's the Greek pronunciation, but it simply means sharing in fellowship, sharing in partnership, sharing and working and building together to represent the kingdom of God. And so I want you to keep those two things in mind because here's the thing that you need to realize. We're going to work really heavy on having an intimate relationship with God that builds so powerfully in you and it fills you so much with the presence of God that it flows out of you that horizontal that touches people's lives and builds a fellowship that represents the kingdom of God in Ava, Illinois. Does that make sense to you? And this is my goal. I, I want you to understand. I believe once I get done, at least I already know in my own life 
the fact of it is, I see a deeper meaning of church than I've ever seen in my life. I see a deeper importance of emphasizing the church because I'm going to tell you what, people may be shocked. I believe he's coming again. I believe we're coming down to the, ch- the headline, but he's not coming for a long ranger. He's coming for people who are intimately connected to him and intimately putting together a representation of his body because his body is his bride and he is coming for his bride, guys. And, you know, I, I, we'll talk a lot about that as we go through this. But, you see, four words I want you to write down, four words that we'll work quite a bit with, okay? Number one is relationship. Relationship. Number two is partnership. Number three is companionship. And number four is stewardship. Now, let me just quickly tell you, and then we're going to talk about how this all fits together. Relationship, which I've already emphasized quite a bit, is a relationship. He says in John 1, he says, I want you to have fellowship. I want you to be connected to the Father and the Son. I want you to experience a relationship that will literally change your whole outlook of life. I want you to have such a relationship that you become a reflection of everything that is related. You see, everything we do in the next few uh, messages is built around this relationship. You see, in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of the Son of Jesus Christ our Lord. Called unto a fellowship, called unto a connection, that develops a meaningful, intimate relationship with him. And you see, we'll deal quite a bit with that, and I want you to realize the importance. And how many realize it's, if you look at the New Testament church, that 120 people gathered up in an upper room, 120 people, disciples, 11 of the disciples, followers who were disciples of Jesus Christ. They gathered in that upper room. They were waiting for a promise. They were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when that Holy Spirit came, that connection came alive in them. And the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. They continued steadfastly. They were devoted. I like that translation. They were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. They were devoted. They were committed to a fellowship. And they were breaking bread and praising God. And God was giving favor and adding souls on a daily basis. Now, I want you to understand, we're talking about a devotion here. They were committed to this cause. And they continue steadfastly in that. They begin to build this type of relationship. Now, this vertical relation deals around having companionship with God and companionship with Jesus, companionship with the Holy Spirit, building and developing within your life that begins to transform. Let me, uh, let me give it to you another way. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine. The Father is the vine dresser. You're the branch. I don't know how many times he said, abide in me. Over and over, you find that word, be connected to me, have relationship with me. You know what else he said? Be connected to my word. Abide in my word. Have relationship with my word. How many realize there must be something important there if this is going to work within our lives? If we are going to produce from the vine, he says, you have to make this decision that you're going to abide in me, have a relationship with me. You're going to have a relationship with my word. It's going to have an impact upon your life. Now, listen to this. Psalms 78.1. It says, listen, O my people. So and undoubtedly, he's trying to get the attention, isn't he, the psalmist? He says, listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Psalms 81.8. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you O Israel, if you would listen to me, 
But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Isn't that a cry of a psalm? How many, you see, from a pastor's point of view, from a pastor's point of view who loves to preach, who loves to teach, my heart breaks because people don't hear and people don't listen and people get set in their ways and people adapt lifestyles that has nothing to do with the Word of God. Then they get in trouble and they wonder, what in the world's wrong? This is what he was saying when he says this connection. Oh, listen, my people. My heart's desire, my cry of God is that you would hear my word and you would walk in my ways, that I could bless you in your going and bless you in your coming. And all that you set your hand to do, I want to prosper you. But he said, you did not listen to me. You did not hear my words. Psalms 106, verse 25. They grumbled in their tents. Oh, my. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Have you ever grumbled in your home? No. Nah. Or under your breath? You ever complain? But here's what he said. He says, they grumbled in their tents. They didn't listen to my voice. Proverbs 8.32. Now, therefore, O son, listen to me. For blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise. Do not neglect. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gate, waiting at my doorpost. Blessed is the person that does that. You see, all I'm simply saying is, when you take John 15 and he says, abide in my word, there is an important thing to consider. He wants you to abide and listen and be connected. He wants to speak to you clearly. He wants to reveal his ways and his life to you. Aren't you, doesn't it challenge you when it says, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts? His ways are better than my ways. How many of you agree with that? Then don't you think it ought to stir up a hunger that if I'm going to have this relationship, then that ought to be a priority in my life? That ought to be something that I set down and I commit myself to, that I'm devoted to, that I'm committed to say, wow, I want to feast off of that. In this communion, in this abiding with him, how many realize that we have an opportunity to pray? How many believe he hears prayer? Don't you believe he hears prayer? Matthew 7, 7 says, ask, seek, and knock, and he will hear, and he will answer, and he will open unto you. Do you really believe? See, that's the question. Do you really believe enough that it's going to affect your life, that you're going to make it a practice? You see. So listen to what the Scripture says. Psalms 4, 1, answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness, thou hast relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Let me believe the psalmist believed in crying out to God. Psalms 34, 15, it says, The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. You know, I, this has been our season of Thanksgiving. But, you know, when you sat down, and I love that, that, I love that old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings. And name them one by one and see what God has done. You know, I, I, I've been overwhelmed and, and, and just thinking, of, uh, asking God simple little things. And, and, and all of a sudden, two or three weeks later, I think, oh, wow. I'm sorry, God, that I didn't honestly recognize. I asked it. You did it abundantly in my life. And I'm sorry that I didn't tell you how much I'm thankful that you were. You see, we need to be mindful in this relationship. That We need to be mindful that as we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son and, and with the Holy Spirit, they're there to hear and answer and work within our lives. It says, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, a sojourner like all my fathers. Psalms 54, 2. Hear my prayer, O God, and give ear to the words of my mouth. Psalms 102, 1, it says, When I'm faint, pour out, and when I pour out my complaints before the Lord, hear me, O God, hear my cry, and help me. You know, how many realize in this intimate relationship, if God already knows what you're going to ask, if God already knows what your need is, how many believe you ought to just be honest? 
Hmm. I mean, I mean, if God already knows and he's going to hear, then just be honest with him and say, well, God, I'm a mess in this area. I need help. Or God, I, I messed up over here and I'm sorry, I, I, but I don't want to do that again. Will you help me? Or God, I, I, I sure got mad at my wife. She just ticked me off. And, 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 and you know, I always said the, the 11th commandment, if there was one, thou shall not pout. You ever pouted? You men, have you ever got mad at your wife and pouted? Silent treatment. Isn't that kind of amazing? But you see, God knows, and God just wants us to be honest. And God just wants us to communicate it where we're at and, and not try to whitewash it. I, I, I did a little thing one time because I was taking a, a, a class in seminary, and, and uh, it was a communication class. And it was always fun, you know, how you say something and, and you know, the person takes it and runs it through their brain and then transmits it back and it may not come out the same way. You know, you're being that way. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then the older you get, you don't hear as well, so you only pick up about half of the thing. And the time you run that through, it can really come out really messed up. You know, and remember the game you used to set in a, 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 and you'd whisper somebody in some, you know, the ear and then they'd whisper to the neck. And the time it got there, it didn't even recognize what come out on the other end. Well, anyway, I, 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 I was working on that type of thing. And I'm thinking, God, I just need to sit down here and we need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And I'm just going to pour my heart out. And that's how I've been praying here lately. I've just been trying to say, God, I, I, you know, uh, uh, I, really, I've just tried to be honest with my God because I, I just want to experience him in my life. And I don't want to try to hide anything, and I want to have this open communion with him that it's a relationship that, you know, he hears me, and sometimes I just need to be still to hear him. Sometimes I just need, you know, to read his word, and, and, and all of a sudden, something, this leaps off of the pages at me. But, you know, there's another part of this relationship. It's called obedience. And listen to John 14 and verse 23. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. You know, here's the neat thing. In this relationship, as you're honest and you pour your heart out, as you feast off his word and you do all these things, but also, how many of you realize, we need to be obedient to him. And if we really love him and our relationship is meaningful, how many of you believe we ought to obey his commandments? Is that not true? That we ought to be willing. And can you imagine the, the results of this? He says, if you love me and you keep my commandments, we're going to come and where you live, we're going to live. Where you go, we're going to go. We're going to put the presence of us uh, going to surround you. I mean, literally, I mean, we talk about I'll dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. He'll be my refuge and he'll be my fortress. And he'll be the shelter in a star. I want you to understand, if you want that, guys, develop this relationship and have a heart to say, I want to obey God and I want to follow your commands and I want to be obedient to the things you say. And you know, Here's the thing, this vertical relationship. If you love me, then love one another. This horizontal relationship. If you love me, then a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. We'll be, to begin to develop this off and on here as we go through this. But can you imagine that he's simply saying that in this relationship, man, the one way for him to abide with you, the one way, is to determine to the best of my ability. I'm going to be committed like this early New Testament church. They were committed and devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were committed and devoted to this fellowship. They were committed and devoted to one another to fulfill and obey the commands of the Lord. And so in that, what a promise that they come and they abode with you, that they come and dwell. I thought that was pretty heavy. What do you, what do you think, guys? And as we look at this, I want you to see three analogies, and then I'm going to quit. Probably only give you one of the analogies, okay? But 
scriptural illustrations of the importance of this relationship, this fellowship, this communion. Three dimensions of it, okay? And here they are. This do John 15, which we've been doing quite a bit, okay? But John 15 is the right stock, the right stem, the right source. How many of you agree with that? Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am the way, the life, and the truth. I am the very thing that you need to be connected to. And I, you have the right vine dresser. Who's the vine dresser? The Father. And guess what? You have the right cultivation. He says he prunes that you may bear more fruit. We don't like the word pruning, but we're going to talk about it because the fact of it is sometimes you need to have your feathers clipped. You know, if there's no conviction... You need to check the connection. If there's no conviction in your life, you need to check the connection. Because you see, what he does, he loves you so much in this relationship that he will prune you. He will bring conviction. He will get your attention. And if you continue, he'll get it a little stronger. You know, no, I'm not going to. I told Jerry said, I'll bet he uses a dog illustration, but I'm not. I caught myself. Jerry just is. Yeah, <laughs> so you have the right stock, you have the vine dresser, the right vine dresser, you have the right cultivator, because the Father is there in that relationship to prune you and help you produce. And let me tell you this, not only that, the right connection, abide in me and abide in my word, okay? And then the right fruit, because you'll bear fruit just like him, okay? But how many of you realize that's choices that you have to make? That you have to do those. Now, here's another one. I like this one. Dining with Christ. How would you like to dine with Christ? Hmm? You know, one of the most honored things in the Mideastern culture was to be an invited guest to come and dine. To be an invited guest to come and share of another family of their fruit and their abundance of blessing. And that was an honored thing. And so you get to Revelations chapter 3. And you find a church named Laodicea. And Jesus is speaking to the church. And he says, I have this thing against you. You're neither hot, you're neither cold, you're lukewarm. And so what he says in the church of Laodicea, he says, you think you have eyesight and you're blind. You think you're rich but you're poor. You think you have need of nothing, but you lack all of these ingredients. He was talking to a Christian church. He was talking to the modern church today. He was talking to people who are set in their ways. He was talking to people who have no need to improve the connection or no need to develop a fellowship, and all of a sudden our churches are cold and they're indifferent and they're not having fellowship. They're not having relationship. They're not having communion. They're not supporting one another. What they're doing is grumbling and fighting and tearing and dividing and making a mockery of our God. What they're doing is they're doing their own thing is what they're doing. And if they don't like it, they pick up and go someplace else. But then they take all the junk with them and guess what they do? They reproduce it again. All of the hang-ups that you couldn't get over with in the one church, you take with you to the next church, and guess what? God, not God, the devil will have somebody that will grab a hold of it and run with you. And so what he said, he said, I love you so much. I care for you so much. I invite you to come and dine with me. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone, if anybody in that church would hear my voice, I'll come and dine with you, and you dine with me. What a privilege. What an honor. You see, in that setting, when you read that, that was the highest honor you could get to be invited to come and dine with somebody. And that's how much he loves you to develop this relationship. He's saying, come and dine with me, and you can dine. I'll dine with you, and you can dine with me, and I'll restore your blindness. I'll heal your brokenness. 
I'll pour in the oil and the wine of my Holy Ghost, and I'll set your hearts ablaze with the glory of God. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Last one, walk with me. Walk in my light. Walk in the light of my life. Listen to what it says. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5, starting at 5. And this is the message that we have heard from him and announce to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, Amos 3, 3 says, Do two men walk together, and thus they are in agreement. I want you to understand something here, and this is probably the most important part of this message. We can appear as a church to have fellowship. We can appear as a church that we worship together. We can appear as a church that we do activities together. We can appear as a church that we are sensitive sometimes. But unless we are honest in our relationship, unless we are honest with God and allow God's light to shine through our lives and expose the darkness, expose the rebellion, expose the sin in our life, and we come into an agreement with that and say, God, I am sorry that I had this blindness in my life. I am sorry that I allowed this sin to dwell in a corner pocket of my life. I am sorry that I have been blinded in these areas and I am in agreement. And that's what it says if we confess our sins, I'm in agreement with what God sees and what his life is exposing. And therefore, I'm confessing and I'm asking you, to set me apart in these areas that I will reflect your light, that I will walk with you, and I will be a reflection of that light. Wow. You know what 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 says? Do not quench the Spirit of God. You know what quenches the Spirit of God? Selfishness, self-centeredness, being centered upon self, self wants to be satisfied. Self wants to be entertained. Self wants to do this or do that. And what God says, I want you to have a relationship. I want you to be devoted to me. I want you to walk in fellowship with me. I want you to walk in the light. Well, well. You see, if we're not abiding, if we're not walking in obedience, we're not in fellowship. You know what we are? We're carnal. And carnal people cause division. Carnal people cause separation. Carnal people create problems and no longer reflect the light, the glory, the fellowship, the relationship that binds us together. Let's stand together this morning. As you stand with me, just bow your heads a moment and, you know, Allow God just softly and tenderly speak to your heart. I want you to hear him this morning. Hear him say, I love you. I long to have a deeper and more meaningful relationship with you. I want this communion type fellowship. I want to have ears to hear. I want to have a heart that will respond and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. As you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, allow God's Holy Spirit to look softly and tenderly into your heart. Allow Him to uncover or expose areas in your life that is not pleasing and acceptable to Him. You know, I've always seen an old lake, and you can look out at that water, and it looks sometimes at the no wind, and that water can look like glass. Beautiful. If you're a fisherman, and there's nothing more beautiful than to be out on a lake early in the morning 
and no wind and that lake, you can see your whole reflection in it. It looks like glass. But you know what's down at the bottom of a lake? Mud, gumbo, gooey mud. And I always think about that because sometimes in our life, God will reach down into the muck and mire of our life, and he'll pull something out. And we think, oh, God, I, I don't like that. Instead of saying, God, thank you for exposing it, we shove it back down in the mud and try to get it stuck down in the bottom where it won't come out. Well, you see, this morning, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to reach down in the depths of your heart, down in the lower levels of your heart. And if there's things that are not pleasing to him, allow him to pull those out. And then do as one, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful, he's righteous to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As God looks into your heart this morning, we're going to pray. You allow God to do some heart surgery on you this morning. You allow God to stir within your heart because I want us to go on this journey together and I want us to learn the meaning of this true fellowship and this relationship and see all of the impacts and effects of it that can be upon our lives. Let's pray together. You allow God to softly and tenderly speak to your heart. Allow him to stir within your life. Father, you're an awesome God. Oh, Father, you're a good, good Father. That's who you are. Wow. And so, Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you look into each one of our hearts, our lives. And, Father, begin to do a, a work through your Holy Spirit and through this relationship that we have with you, that you would begin to mold and shape us in the vessels that would be meat for your use. Father, you know my heart. You know my thoughts. You know my ways. I pray that you'll help each one of us to have a pure heart that our ways will become your ways, that our thoughts will become your thoughts, that our thirst and our hunger will be a more meaningful and deeper relationship with you. Well, help us to be devoted, committed to abiding with you and your word. Help us have ears, spiritual ears, spiritual eyes to hear and to see. And I thank you for that. So, Father, we ask you to forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us where we've missed the mark. And Father, set us apart this morning as vessels for you. Thank you, Father God. You are wonderful. You are marvelous. You are mighty. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your cleansing. And Father, I pray that you'd pour in the love of your Holy Spirit into our lives. That you would pour in the ingredients of your Spirit that would help us be overcomers. And I thank you, Father. You alone are worthy to receive it. And we give you praise, we give you thanksgiving, for you alone are worthy to receive it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, hug somebody around you. Tell them you love them in Christ.